Hello everyone, welcome to another repair video. So today we're going to be working on this Xbox One X which has been sent in for no display. So this console in particular was sent by my former employer and it's one of his customers so this is a business to business repair. It's apparently got no display and he doesn't know what's wrong with it. So I'm going to send it down and I'd have a look to see if I can get it fixed for him. The condition that you see it in there is the condition that it got sent in so it's already been disassembled by my former employer and the most of the screws are in this box here but what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to take the outer casing off and take it apart as much as I can to be able to test it because I don't know how reassembled it, it's been I did tell him not to bother reassembling it and just to put it back together so it's all held together because it's going to make it a lot quicker for me and it saved him some time he could move on to another job I don't actually know what diagnostics have been done on this I didn't ask I'd rather do my own diagnostics because then I can get my own opinion uh, but this has apparently got this has apparently got no display and no display typically on an Xbox One X is down to one of a few things several but not too many so the first one that it could be is the hard drive now the hard drive no, no display when the hard drive has failed is because it is attempting to boot the software and it can't boot the software because it can't access the file required so it leaves it with a black display and usually you'll know that the hard drive is failed because the screen will stay on so your screen won't turn off it won't it won't think that there's no input and it will just basically your screen will stay on but you'll get nothing on the, on the picture and that's a typical indication of a faulty hard drive now the other reason could be down to the EMI filters now the EMI filters I've explained in several videos before but I'll explain them again now but the EMI filters are basically just little coils of wire which filter out noise and interference from the HDMI circuit before it's processed through the HDMI port now sometimes these can go bad and they can go bad in one of several ways they can become open circuit so as you know a coil of wire is supposed to be continuous it's just one big coil and sometimes they can become open circuit so what that means is the wire inside the coil breaks and it can no longer complete the connection sometimes they can get shorted to ground and there are several reasons why they could go faulty we could have some sort of an issue with the HDMI circuit we could have a issue where the customer has tried to plug the HDMI port in one key or we could have an issue with the TDP158 which is the HDMI retimer chip on these consoles so the retimer chip is another thing that can go wrong on them and basically what the retimer chip is responsible for is it takes the audio and video signals from the APU from the GPU and CPU it synchronizes all those signals and sends them out to the TV in a language that the TV can understand so sometimes they go bad and if they go bad you can either get no display you can get a flickering display you can get a distorted display lines on the display half a display um, you can get all sorts of all sorts of issues uh, the, the the limits are endless you could get no you could get no sound but picture you could get picture but no sound uh, the limits are really endless on what could go wrong when the HDMI retimer chip shorts out you could also get it where the HDMI retimer chip has gone bad and that causes the EMI filters to short circuit to ground so basically the only path to ground for the EMI filters is through the chip or through the port itself so let's go ahead and take this apart I'm not going to switch it on yet because I don't know how far this has been disassembled so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this apart make sure that all of the main components are connected to be able to get a display so the hard drive the motherboard power supply and not that don't really need it but the disk drive as well so I'll make sure that all the components are there and that they're all plugged in and then I'll get the test in this console so let's go ahead and just take it apart like I said I do have the screws in my in a little tub in the box that it came in okay so that was a little bit tricky to remove because nothing screwed down uh, which is kind of my fault for saying not to uh, reassemble it I guess right so let's just take off this front panel and the Wi-Fi board is there as well okay so let's pop off that connector 
and then let's remove the console from the outer casing. So let's just flip it upside down. There we go. Okay, so here it is, and um, it looks like everything's connected. As far as I know, as far as I've been told, I think this is a pretty much brand new console, which is a little bit strange. Okay, so we've got the got the disk drive connected, the hard drive is connected, fan is connected, good. So let's pop the power supply back on and now we can just test this as it is out the case and see what's going on. Um, now I'm assuming my former employer has tested the hard drive maybe. Uh, I'm not 100% sure but I don't know. I'm not sure how far his knowledge goes on consoles. Right so let's turn it on. Oh, actually let's get a HDMI lead first. Okay, so HDMI lead is plugged in. So I'm going to turn this on now in 3, 2, 1. And the console turns on. The fan spins. So let's see what happens on the screen, shall we? And I think that it's shorting out my screen. My screen has completely gone off. That's a uh, that's a new one. So I'm going to turn my screen off by the wall. Turn it back on. I've unplugged the HDMI port, so my screen has gone completely off when I plug that in. So at the moment, it's going to be flickering from it's going to be flickering from analog to HDMI. Um, okay, so I'm going to plug it in. I'm going to plug in the HDMI port, 3, 2, 1. And then a switch to HDMI. And we get no display through the screen at all. So it's not even recognising that the port is there. So definitely not a port issue. So I would say... I would say this is probably the retimer chip. It's not recognising that the port is there. Usually it will pick up that the HDMI has been plugged in. Uh, so that means there's a break in the circuit somewhere and it's stopping the signal from passing through. So I'm going to unplug the HDMI. I'm going to plug it back into my monitor. Or rather plug it back into my PC. And let's get this thing disassembled and then we can get to testing. Alright, so I'm going to flip it upside down. And as you can see, the port looks absolutely mint. Um, right, so I'm going to undo these four screws that are holding the motherboard in place. But then what I'm going to do after that is I'm going to try another hard drive. Because I can't rule out anything until I try it. And the hard drive could be a cause for no display. So I'm going to rule out the hard drive first of all. I'm not going to plug this one into... I'm not going to plug this one into the computer because there's a chance it might remove the user data. Which I have come across before where I've plugged it into the computer and it removes the user data. So, I'm not going to plug it into the computer unless I know for a fact it's dead. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get another hard drive. I'm going to format it for Xbox. In fact, I think I've got one. Uh, so I'm going to get another hard drive. I'm going to plug it in and I'll see if it picks up the display or not. Okay, so those four screws are out then. So I'm going to remove the hard drive 
from its caddy or from its little spot. So let's pop that to one side. Let's not lose that clip. And I apologise, I just realised you can't see what I'm doing. Okay, so I've got a hard drive here from my Xbox One S. Um, these are the same connectors, so it's absolutely fine. There we go. Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave that hanging free and I'm going to plug the power back in and see if anything loads up on the screen. Um, my screen turned off. It's not shorted out this time. Okay, we're getting nothing on the screen at all. So that's ruled out a hard drive fault. Okay, so let's get this thing disassembled and uh, we can take a further look at this and see what's causing the no display issue. So it's not the hard drive, we know that now. So let's get rid of the power supply and the disk drive. So that's fairly warm as well, so I'm wondering if this has been reassembled without cleaning. Okay. So let's go ahead and get this clamp off. To do that, I'm just going to take a flat screwdriver and before I do that I'm making sure there's no prior damage from anyone else taking this apart. It doesn't look like there is, which is good. Uh, it does look like this clamp has been put back on though, has been taken off though, so Yeah, like I said, I don't know how far my former employer went into diagnosing this. Okay, so there's the heating clamp. Perfectly safe removal again. And let's get rid of this heating. There we go. So one thing we don't want to do is lose this thermal paste um, because that will cause the VRM to overheat. So let's go ahead and take a look around and see if we can see anything interesting with this, shall we? So I'm wondering if this HDMI encoder has been chained. So I'm going to have a look under the microscope. Okay, so the joints on this retimer I see do look original. So it looks like it's got lead free solder on there. Um, the only reason I think that is because it's a bit duller than what it would be if it was changed. Uh, so it looks like this circuit hasn't been touched at all, which is great. That means we can go ahead and start doing some diagnostics on that. And what I'm going to do, first of all, I'm going to have to spin this around so I can actually get to it, but I'll try my best to keep you in shot. But what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to test these EMI filters. So these little components here, just in front of my finger, where it says EG3 and EG4, those are EMI filters. And like I said earlier, they essentially filter out noise from the HDMI circuit before it sends it out to the TV. And like I said, they are essentially just a coil of wire. Uh, it's just a filter. It's just like a normal SMD filter, it's just that there's four on one component so eight in total and I know there are five pins on each side of these but the middle pin is a ground pin. Uh, not quite too sure why they put a coil there on ground. Uh, it's not like it's on the PS4 but the Xbox One has a full component with five pins on it. But there's four filters there, there's four VMI filters there for the circuit and like I said there's another one there for ground. So the only real way that they can become shorter to ground is through the chip. Uh, I mean it is technically possible for them to become shorter to ground on these particular consoles by one of these pins bridging with the middle one. But that's very very unlikely and I've never personally come across it myself. Uh, but the way we test these is essentially we just put our multimeter into continuity mode. 
top one probe on the top and one probe on the bottom. And if we've got a complete circuit there, if that filter is good, it will be. So we test the top to the bottom. If, it, if it's good, it will be. If it's bad, it won't be. But also if it's bad, we can also have continuity between pin 1 and pin 2, or pin 3 and pin 4, or in fact even pin 1, pin 3, pin 1, pin 4, and so on and so forth. Uh, if we've got continuity against all of the, against any of those, then it's definitely bad. Uh, but if we've got continuity between, say for example, 1 and 2, then it could be the filter or it could be the chip. If we've got continuity between, say for example, 1 and ground, or 2 and ground, then it's most likely going to be the chip. Uh, likewise, if we've got continuity, continuity between, for example, 1 and 3, or 1 and 4, or 2 and 4, 2 and 3, then it, it's most likely going to be the chip, unless there's a big blob of solder there somewhere, or unless that coil of wire has broke off, sprung out, and it's took in one of the other coils. Um, so, yeah, essentially what that's all we're going to do is we're going to test these Test these filters for continuity, make sure they're all good, and if not the filters, then the most likely scenario is going to be this chip here. So, we're in continuity mode, so continuity mode is the mode that's going to go B, when we complete the circuit between the two probes. So, I'm going to start testing these filters now. So, I'll start from the left hand side, I'll start from pin 1 on the left, and we can do this several ways. We can test the continuity from the pin on the actual port itself and just follow the trace down or we can test it from this side and follow the trace up so what I tend to do is I tend to or lately anyway not not all the time but recently I've started doing it like this so I'll pop one probe on the bottom of the filter and then I'll pop the other probe on the HDMI port and that will tell me if there's continuity between the port and the bottom of this area here so if we complete that circuit it's going to beep and if there's no complete circuit there then it's not going to beep so let's test these now so pin 1 is good and do we have continuity to ground? we don't pin 2 we have no continuity to ground and we have continuity there pin 3 which is essentially pin 4 no ground and we have continuity at the, at the port pin 5 continuity no ground and now we can check for continuity against the other filters which no which filter 4 doesn't have Filter 3 doesn't have. Filter 2 doesn't have. Uh, filter 1 won't have because we've already tested those. So now let's move on to the next filter, which is this one here. Or the next row of filters. So we have continuity there. No short. And no short to pin 2. No short to pin 3. No short to pin 4. Uh, filter 2, no short to ground, we have continuity there, no continuity there, no continuity there, and no continuity there, good. Filter 3, no short to ground, we have continuity there, we don't have continuity there, no continuity there, and no continuity there. And the final one, filter 4, is good, no short to ground, no short, no short, and no short. So both of these filters are testing absolutely fine, let's just check the grounds. That one's continuous, so is that one, and this, this side will be the same, yep. So. These filters are good, so now the next thing I want to inspect is going to be the HDMI port itself. So I'm going to check and make sure we've got no breaks in these legs. So to do that, all I'm going to do is give this the nudge test on each of the pins. I'm just going to nudge every pin, make sure that none of them are loose.
Um, that pin is actually a little bit loose. So we've got pin number six is a little bit loose. So what I'm going to do is, and I'm not sure if you can see this. But on the actual port itself, I'm going to try and guide it. I'm looking at this upside down through a camera now, so it's a little bit awkward. But pin number six from the left hand side is a little bit loose. It's not completely loose, this one here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scrape away at this wire a little bit. And I'm just going to check continuity from the pin itself to that wire because that's where that trace goes to. So I'm going to scrape away at that using my tweezers and I'm going to make sure that the path is continuous so I really don't need much copper exposed need a little bit of copper exposed and then I can test the continuity very little indeed and uh, we have continuity to the pin so we have continuity from the via to the pin you can hear that B so that's good so let's test the rest of these pins now and again like I say all I'm doing is just nudging these pins making sure that none of them are broken I have already inspected the port inside, so it's not the port itself. And uh, all of those are good. Right, okay, so next thing I want to do quickly is I just want to test this little circuit here. Just make sure that we haven't got any shorts where there shouldn't be. Make sure that this chip is doing its job. Uh, the chip number for this is NFD737, which I'm not actually sure what it does. I think it might be some sort of another of a 4K filter or something. But I'm not actually sure what it does. Okay. Okay, so let's check for some shorts on the actual retimer chip itself. Okay, so I'm going to follow these traces down. And then there goes the ACU. Okay. So, there doesn't appear to be anything wrong with the circuit. However, there's clearly something wrong. Right. Okay. So, I think this chip is going to be responsible for the no display issues. Uh, I think it's just gone bad and these things do happen from time to time so I'm going to go ahead and get that chip replaced so to do that I'm going to use some hot air I'm going to set the hot air to 480 degrees and I'm going to heat the board up first and then I'll slowly come down and try and remove this chip these do take a lot of heat to remove and they can be a bit of a nightmare so we want to make sure that we direct the heat away from these RAM chips just make sure that we don't overheat these RAM chips and cause any kind of unnecessary issues with the RAM uh, because reboarding RAM is not a fun task and I do not really feel like doing it so um, we just want to make sure that we don't damage the RAM while we're removing this chip uh, it is very close and it can be quite, quite a risk so we'll make sure we don't do that and we'll get this chip removed So 
Tom's reforming the board up now. Around the general area. Okay, and now I'm going to come in and I'm going to direct my heat on an angle so as we don't direct heat towards the ramp. And I'm going to get this chip removed. So it's going to take a little while. Like I said, these do take an awful lot of heat to remove these chips. Uh, there's a massive ground pad underneath and it's absorbed a lot of the heat. And now I'm directing my heat straight down. So as to heat that ground pad up. And I'm putting slight upward pressure on the chip itself. So I'm not pulling on the chip, but I am putting slight upward pressure on the chip. Uh, so basically I'm kind of very lightly tugging on the chip. And the reason for that is because as soon as this chip's ready to come off, I'll know. And I want this chip off as quick as I can, and I want this heat away from this board as quick as I possibly can. Because this is very close to the RAM chips. It's not like the Xbox One S, where the RAM is in the middle of the board. These are a much smaller form factor, and the RAM is much closer to these chips. There we go. So that chips off. They'll actually come off a lot better than they usually do. So they're usually really difficult to get off. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to clean up the area and I'm going to replace this solder with some leaded solder. So the solder that's used on these boards is lead free solder and it has a much higher melting temperature than leaded solder does. So I'm going to add this, I'm going to replace the solder that's around the kit to, with leaded solder. Lower the melting temperature, make it a lot easier to put a new chip on. And it'll be a lot safer to work on that area of the board. So I'll start by adding some flux and all I'm going to do is I'm just going to add some leaded solder to the tip and I'm just going to drag my soldering iron across these pads Okay, so, so I've got a nice big puddle of solder in the middle there, and you'll see that the soldering iron can't quite handle it. Um, my soldering iron is not expensive, and the ground plane sucks up most of the heat. So if we use the heat gun, There we go. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to take some wick and I'm going to clean off the entire area. And then I can get to adding some fresh leaded solder down afterwards. So again I'm going to use the heat gun to assist me. I'll just wick away those pads. and then give it a clean so we can start to prepare it for some fresh solder. So the reason I use heat to help me there is like I say the soldering iron loses heat when you apply it to a big ground plane and that's normal but a good soldering iron will compensate for it and it heats it up again instantly whereas unfortunately mine don't it's not an expensive iron it's about 150 pound um, and it's yeah it's not the best so there is that okay so that's nice and clean now ready for ready for some fresh leaded solder so let's add some more flux
And again, I'm just going to add some solvent to the tip of the iron. And just tin these pads. So you'll notice how I use the drag method for tinning these pads. The reason I use the drag method is because it's just easier and quicker. And that's going to do it for the middle blob. So I'll just need to spread this middle blob around to get rid of those solder bridges. So I'm going to use a heat gun. Okay. So there's too much solder on the middle of the on the middle ground plug ground pad. But when I put the new tip on, what's gonna happen is the solder that's underneath there, that's the excess solder that's underneath there is gonna splurge out. And because of the heat and the flux, everything's gonna flow back together and those pads are gonna basically unbridge the cells. So I'm gonna solder it on and then I'm gonna push down on the chip and what that's gonna do is it's gonna splurge out all the excess and reflow all the rest of the joints and allow it to make a good connection. So we want this chip basically as flat to the board as we possibly can. We're going to use the hot air station again. And again the hot air station is going to be set to 480 degrees. Even though this is leaded solder, it still takes a lot of heat to penetrate the board. And it's still going to take a fair bit to get this chip on. We just add leaded solder to make it quicker and safer. So I've had some flux, and I'm going to get the board fairly warm. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tack the tack the chip down, and then once it's tacked down, I can push down on the chip and push out all of the excess solder. It doesn't have to be in perfect position for now. So you'll see that's in place now, and once that actually, once that, that solder actually hardens, that chip wouldn't actually move. So you'll see that's on there pretty good. But what we're going to do now, we're just going to push down on the chip. And you'll see that some solder is actually splurged out the side. Now before we go any further, I'm going to clean up that excess. Just like so. And get rid of that little solder blob. We don't want that strain on the console somewhere, making it short. So you'll see now that solder is starting to squeeze out. Anything that's not needed will push itself out. Good. And now we can actually get this soldered into place. Okay, there's a little bit more squeezing out still. Oh, 
Right, and now let's get it aligned, shall we? Okay. Well, that looks good from the angle I'm looking at it from. But I won't know for sure until I look under the microscope. And I'm just going to clean up these joints. Okay, so let's look at this under the scope now. And it's not quite in alignment. It's not quite there. It's a little bit low on one side. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to clean up, put some fresh flux down and then make sure this is straight. You can see all that burnt flux flying around. I'm going to get rid of that. Okay, so let's dry off the area a little bit, add a bit more flux, Okay, that appears a bit better. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, that appears to be a bit better, so I'm going to change the tip on my soldering iron to a very thin tip, and then I'm going to come in and just solder each of these joints individually, make sure there's no bridges, and also make sure that every joint is as good as it can be. So because this is a very thin tip, I'm going to use a bit of the heat gun just to help me transfer heat. This is a very small tip and it's pretty difficult to transfer transfer the heat on these. There we go. Those joints look a bit better. I'm going to clean up now. So just pouring isopropyl alcohol onto the chip or onto the general area. Let's get rid of as much of that flux as we possibly can. We don't want any of that stuff left on the board. Okay, so let's use the heat gun one more time. And all we're doing now is just drawing off the isopropyl. So most of the ice propel will evaporate itself, but there'll be little puddles underneath chips and stuff, which we want to try and get off. It's not going to hurt the board, but it's always nice to have a clean board when you finish. So I'm going to let that board cool, and then what I'm going to do, I'm going to get it all reassembled and give it a test. Alright, so the console's been cooled down now, and it should be ready for testing. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to test it out of the case first, just in case it doesn't work. But I'm going to put the heat sink on because these Xbox One X's do run incredibly, incredibly hot. So I'm going to put the case back on. I'm going to put the heat sink on. And we'll pop the clamp on. I don't like pop popping the clamp on before I test it, but it's one of those things that I always do on an Xbox One X or a PS4 Pro. And the simple reason for that is because they run incredibly, incredibly hot. So I never reassemble, I never test these without reassembling it at least partially. It's just not worth the risk.
Let's take the customer's hard drive. And let's pop the disk drive in. And we can pop the power supply in. So I just need to get this lined up inside the slots. There we go. Uh, let's not forget the fan. So that is ready for testing. So I'll pop on the front panel so we can turn it on and I must remember to put that back before we finish. Right okay so pretty much ready for testing now and I'm going to pop in a power lead and I'm also going to grab the HDMI cable. Let's pop you onto the screen. Let's turn it on. There we go. Cool. Right, so we're in 640 by 480 at the minute, uh, which is perfectly normal. It happens from time to time when you change the retiming chip, but that looks good. Yes, okay, it's on the welcome screen. All right. Right, so let's shut this off now. And um, pretty much all that's left to do now is to reapply some fresh thermal paste and get this thing put back together. Just in case you're curious, the reason the screen was flickering is because my HDMI lead is a little bit dodgy. So if I wiggle my HDMI lead, you'll see my screen going on and off. Uh, so the flickering is going to be down to my HDMI lead, not the console. So looks like the console is fully working. What I will do is, once I've reassembled everything, I will go into my house and fully test it. Uh, where I've got another HDMI lead. I need to buy some because I'm completely and utterly out. I keep breaking them. As you can imagine, uh, given the fact that I swap the HDMI lead from source to source 15, 20 times a day, uh, it's, uh, it puts a lot of stress on the port, on the cable. So. Yeah, there is that. Well, okay, so this is going to need some fresh thermal paste. And uh, I apologise if my audio is low or a little bit messed up. Uh, I realised just before I tested this that the mixer was turned down. So I might have to boost the audio for this a little bit. But I do apologise about that. Right, so let's get this thing cleaned up. So let's just get rid of this old thermal paste. Okay, there's a lot of stubborn paste on here. Right, so what I'm going to do, because there's stubborn paste on here, I'm going to just get some tweezers and just pretty much pick at some of the paste. So I'm not scratching away at the APU, all I'm doing is just picking away at some of this paste. Trying to get as much of the old crusty stuff off as I possibly can. And I'm obviously being careful not to be knocking any transistors or anything like that off. Because that would be absolutely catastrophic. Okay. Now I'm going to get some IPA. I'm going to soak the IPU. I just want to get as much of this off as I possibly can. Okay, dog. I'll take some tissue and soak up 
that APU and then just dry the rest off using a cotton swab. Okay, there we go. So that's about as clean as that's going to come. So let's get the stuff off here as well. There we go. Beautiful. So let's get some thermal paste now. Perfect. Let's pop the heatsink back on. And the clamp. Excellent. And now we're ready to get this back in its case. Okay, ladies and gents, that is done. So there is a couple of screws missing. Um, the screws from inside, I've replaced all the missing ones. There was one normal fat Xbox screw and one small black screw. Uh, and outside, there's one black screw missing. So I'm sure that's going to be at the shop somewhere. If not, who knows who's lost it. But it wasn't in the tub, so... There's nothing I can do. Uh, just to show you that's working. So it's still in 480p because I haven't actually connected the controller up to it yet to change it. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's working absolutely fine. So I'm going to grab the controller and I'll be back in a moment. Okay, dokie. So I've got myself a controller. So I'm going to sync that up now. There we go. And uh, yep, yeah, that's fine. I know it overheated. So let's set it to 1080p and uh, keep it at 1080p. Excellent. So let's connect to Wi Fi. Okay, connected to the internet. Excellent. So 25 meg update. Oh, and 590, whatever. There you go. Okay, so that's going to run through the update, and once it's done that, I'll be back. Oh, right. So, that update is finally done. It took a long time to verify, which is a bit annoying, but uh, yeah, it is what it is. Um, I'm going to have to sign in with my own account. I'll do a factory reset afterwards. Uh, I just need to test everything, make sure it's all working. So I'll skip through this bit and then I'll jump back on. Okay, so just going to check a couple of things. Just make sure that it's picking up the hard drive correctly. And that we've got 1080p, which we are. Uh, it's not going to show 4K because this monitor isn't 4K. Uh, let's just make sure that we're showing the storage, which we are. Excellent. So, uh, oh, hang on a minute. What did that say then on the storage? 55 gigabyte free. So, why is it factory set itself? Uh okay. Very strange. Right, never mind. Okay. Uh to be honest I'm not sure why it's factory reset itself, but it just has. Okay, so just to summarise then, this console was originally sent to my former employer because it had a no signal issue. The no signal issue was caused by a HDMI encoder OC. The no signal issue was caused by the HDMI retimer, the TDP158, which is the 4K version of Microsoft's retimer chip. And by replacing that chip, we were able to successfully restore the display. Unfortunately, somewhere along the way, the console has lost its data, but 
Uh, it is what it is. Data should be backed up on the cloud anyway, so shouldn't be too much of a problem for the customer. Um, but somewhere along the way, this console has lost its data. Um, but that's going to be it for this video. I hope you found this video helpful, and I also hope you found it entertaining. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them down in the comment section down below, and I'll do my very best to get back to you. Leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it, and please hit the subscribe button. I'm trying really, really hard to get to 5,000 subscribers by the end of the year, and if you could subscribe and hit that bell notification so you get notified when I upload, it would really help the channel out a lot. Thanks very much for watching, guys, and until next time, see you later. Bye for now.